So today we're going to play a new kind of game. Oh my god, this is heavy. Oh, the game that we're going to play today is... What's in the giant wood box? I've had, I've got three or four of these that are just sitting here that I have honestly no memory what's in the crate. But they've been waiting and waiting and waiting for me to get around to them and I can't, I can't trip over them anymore. I just I can't. So. Oh. It's an SP220. Okay. Interesting. Wow. He's got this pinned in here with I guess I'm gonna have to take the back off of this. I guess. He's got metal clamps situated in the front of this thing. Like right up here pinned up against the, the front of the thing and I can't come on turn oh that doesn't sound good give him credit he used some good screws Jesus. Okay. I guess. I'm running out of screws to take out of this thing here. One times. There's screws, there's busted off feet, there's oh. oh that can't be good. Hopefully it's just the nuts and stuff off the faceplate. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well. Yeah. <sighs> It's a flat blader. <laughs> oh, Morty. Okay. Well, it was in a crate. And the crate beat the hell out of this thing. 
see if we're going to be able to get it apart. Base plate's intact. My body sure didn't take a, a good trip. Oh, great. Flat blade. That's an interesting modification. It's a fun game, I'm here to tell you. body screw right there that fell out. Now where is my driver? There it is. For the love of God, tell me you didn't send the tubes in here. No, there's a bunch of extra parts that I don't know what they go to. Whole front portion of that thing. So here's some diodes. Some oddball relay. Light bulbs are out of the back of the meters. This got beat so hard the ear bent off. Look at that. Wow. Right now my brain's trying to figure out how I can go about packaging this differently for him. So it doesn't take quite a beating on the way home. Alright, side plate's off. Yay, side plate. <laughs> it's all mounting hardware. Okay. Nuts and bolts and washers and shit. Pim nuts and everything. Good lord. Another washer, some more nuts. Pim nut. Lord. What's that go to? Well, 
shut. Let me call the customer. That was an interesting phone call with the customer. He says that uh, he'd bought this from an estate or a ham fest or something. He brought it home, he hooked it up, um, he turned it on, and it worked for a little while. Then the uh, one tube wouldn't light up. So a one tube wouldn't light up, so then he changed out the capacitor bank. And then when he put the capacitor bank in it, it kept blowing the breaker as soon as he'd plug it in. And he says this ground wire, if he would disconnect this, the breaker would quit popping and then the tubes would light up and that's where he just gave up and he sent it to me so let's see if we can figure out the obvious things first so let's go check our diodes we got our meter on diode check that one's blown not blown blown not bl blown blown not blown but low blown wide open not blown not blown not blown not blown not blown and the output one blown okay so the whole high voltage board is shorted let's take a look at our glitch to see if it ever let go nope metering circuits good okay we're good all the way across let's go over here let's look at this that looks good three meg this is our metering resistors by the way 3.5-ish, 3.5-ish. Let's make sure I got continuity from here to here. I do, and then from here to here. I do, and then from here to here. I do, okay. So now we're gonna go back to diode check. So what that, whoa, whoa. Let's pull the microphone off. So what that tells me, you guys, is the high voltage circuit is shorted and has been shorted and it got shorted pre case ground so that means from here to here back to here got shorted someplace so now we have to go with the evidence that we have on hand what we've been told and he says that he replaced the capacitor bank well let's take a look at the capacitor bank this is the Harbach capacitor bank and it's got protection diodes on each one of the caps so Not bad, not bad, not bad, not bad. Blown, 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 blown. Okay, so either he's got a cap hooked up backwards or when the rectifier ring went out for whatever reason, it was probably because he tried to run it with a lid off, maybe. Maybe. Let's see if there's uh No, there's no scorch marks on the shorting bar, so it's not that. Oh, no, there's a big one right here. This thing got ran without the... Uh, thing got ran without the lid. But it's all on the ground side. Most of the blown diodes, except for the first one on the positive rail, are on the ground side. So it all points back to the capacitor bank. So for us to go any further, we have to, one, pull the capacitor bank out, disassemble it, and figure out what's been put together wrong. Like there's probably a cap that's in here backwards. Seen that before, many a time. Then we got to rebuild the rectifier board, and then put all this back together, and then retest it. And then we can go look at our filament voltage and our, what they call bias flop. So, let's do the cap bank first.
the nut that holds the breaker in place is physically sheared off. So that's got to be visited. Okay, fun times. I'm going to back off this screw, this screw, there's another one down here and then another one right underneath this rectifier board. So back those off, we'll slide the whole cap bank up, up this direction and then we'll slide the whole cap bank out. Okay. Something very much got hooked up backwards at some point. That one's correct. And it could have been just a wire got hooked up backwards at some point and it backed up through the capacitor bank because this is a voltage doubler circuit and it just wiped out these protection diodes. That's positive. So that one's correct. Personally, I don't care for those diodes being in here. It's a non-starter to me. Okay, that one was in there electrically, correct? So was that one. Interesting. Positive. Negative, yeah, yeah, yeah. Positive. Positive, huh. Well. And result is blown diodes. So that tells me that something's gone on up the food chain that's causing the problem. So there's one way to get rid of the problem with the diodes, replace them or remove them. I just spent 30 minutes looking for this divider. I had to go back and look at the YouTube video and found out, or not the YouTube, the, the previous video segment and found out that divider wasn't even there. I'm like, okay, so I'm hooked up to the bias diode which is testing good which is a huge relief I don't think our filament transformer is smoked because it doesn't stink to a whole high hell so let's go ahead I pulled the rectifier board out of line so that one's shorted Shorted, 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 shorts, shorts, good, 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 blown, okay something went wrong with the high voltage that nobody's wanting to admit to that's okay it's okay it's not my job to it's just my job to kind of fix things here right so it means i need to rebuild this whole board I'll suck all these diodes off of here and throw them away now i like to replace them with the 10 a 10s now he did send a whole bag full of the stock diodes there's not enough so let's get the old solder sucker out and we'll come through and we'll clean all these off and um, yeah we're just going to clean this up and make it ready for reinstall so let me slap more diodes in this thing let's see do i got any 10 a 10s i don't know there's a hundred there's a hundred 200, 200, so 400, 500 pieces. I think I got this technology. I'll be back. Well, <clears throat> this thing is completely rebuilt. 
Focus, focus. Took it all apart, cleaned it all up, checked every part, soldered everything back together. Good luck blowing those. If you do, there's gonna be some big shit flying across the room. Okay, so now what we gotta do is reinstall this back into here. So I like to do the bias before I do anything else. So you know you got your bias board that goes here. That wire goes through here. Top wire goes there, the bottom wire goes there, and we're gonna hook everything back up. So let me get this installed and we'll get the faceplate reattached. And then we'll loosely mount the faceplate and then we'll probably convert this over for 110 because it's currently set up for 220 so I can use it on a Variac and slowly bring it on instead of just hitting it full bore and watching shit blow out of the box. Make sense? But I'm pretty sure between this and what we found on going on over here that we should be able to bring it on pretty easily and it should just come right back to life. At least the high voltage side of things. I'm interested to see what's going on with the filament. With him saying one tube wasn't lighting, but sometimes that's usually how the tube is sitting in the socket. You pull the tube out and stick the tube back in the socket, sometimes it'll fix the problem. But we'll see. Then we're going to go and run it, and I know this guy is an 11, 10 meter guy. I mean, 10 meter dude. So we'll have to leave the faceplate loose because we might have to adjust that. We'll see. Okay, so since we've been back, the high voltage board's in, the capacitor bank's hooked up, the plate transformer's hooked up, repaired the breaker on the back of the amp. Um, that just needed a little bit of glue. Put that all back together for this guy. Um, it was also missing the king. So there's some stuff cut out of the bottom of this that I'm a little, like why? Why would you even cut that out? There's a blue wire that goes between the <clears throat> 110 volt relay and the uh, RCA jack on the back. Anyhow, it wired this up for uh, 110 so we can use the old Variac on it and uh, got the high temp or high volt probe shoved in at the end of the plate choke so I can see the entire circuit. I've got this reading in thousands, so there's two, like two volts floating on the power supply right now. So let's get, let's bring our Variac on. And I'm not feeling any resistance as I turn this up. See, look, we've already got high voltage going on. There's a thousand volts and we're not even uh, 60 volts in the input. Oh yeah, this is strong. 90 volts, 95, 100. And we're floating at 110, there's 3,000 volts. We'll go to the low tap. Meter's not working, we'll come back and figure out what the deal is with that. I can guarantee you this guy's not gonna wanna get that fixed. Low tap's working, switch to the high tap. High tap working, no arcs, no sparks, no explosions. We'll grab the FLIR, we'll see if the filament transformer's hot. Usually they get really hot when they go bad, it's the only thing I'll have to really check here. Nope, the only thing hot on the front end of this box is the bleeders. Transformer's ice cold. Can't believe them with the lights being blown out of the, the meters, they're still working, but they are. These two. Let's check our bleeders. Bleeders are working. Okay, well, we'll set all this mess aside for the minute. And um, we'll wait for this to bleed down to zero. Then we'll go ahead and we'll ground it out hard. And um, we'll see if we can diagnose what's going on with the meter. Maybe a wire just got broke off on the back. Maybe it's lost its ground, but we've got no meter movement. But the long and the short is the high voltage is fixed. So that tells us that the plate transformer is relatively good. Capacitor bank is working fine. The rectifier circuit's working fine. Now it's just to get the little bugs out of it. And once this, we get this down to zero, we'll identify what's going on with the meter, and then we can flip it over and make sure that we've got filament volts and bias flop.
Okay, gents, um, we're working on this SB220, and like I said in the previous segment, we're gonna flip it over and check for filament and bias switch, or what they call bias flop. Now, I'm gonna break this out in its own separate video for everybody to watch, even though I've shown this like 100 times on YouTube on video, but I've never done its own independent video on how to check this voltage. So when I say, well, I showed it on video, everybody's like, well, where's the link? I've never done a specific video just for this. I didn't think I'd had to, but there's three or four guys that I'm working with right now, this minute, and I keep telling them there's something wrong with their bias. And they're like, no, I, I don't get it. I don't understand what you're talking about. Okay, so we're going to explain it. So right now, we've got our probe set on AC. Your tube works on two separate principles. AC for the filament but DC voltage for the bias. So let's go ahead and bring our filament on. So we brought the amp on and for SP, uh, 3500Z you're looking at roughly about 5 volts, 5.5 volts in the filament. So we're going to look at that on AC on this lead and the other lead. Now I can tell you right now there's nothing wrong with this filament transformer. Okay. Now, how do we check for our bias? Well, let's turn our amplifier off so we don't get ourselves electrocuted. We're gonna disconnect our positive lead and disconnect our negative. We're gonna take our negative and we're gonna hook it up to the case. We're gonna take our positive and it doesn't matter if the positive's on the front or on the back, we're gonna leave this hooked up to the back, okay? So now what we're going to do is we'll turn the amplifier back on, but first we've got to turn our voltmeter to DC. So now we're reading DC current, or DC volts, from case to the filament leg. As we can see, we've got 126.8 volts worth of DC voltage that's present. Once again, it doesn't matter which leg you probe this on. You have 126 volts DC that's present. On the AC side, you're going to have half the voltage before, because you're only reading half of the transformer. But you need to look on the DC side. This 128, 2930, I've seen them as high as 135. That voltage will stop your tube from doing anything. It's called cutoff voltage. If you have this voltage applied to the tube and you step on a foot pedal and your relay clacks down, let's say like your bias zener goes out. That's the diode that's up on the, the high, behind the high voltage board. If your bias zener goes out, you're not going to get any bias flop. Now what do I mean by bias flop? We've hooked up ground here and now watch what happens. I step on a pedal and now our voltage drops to 3.37 volts. It'd actually be a little bit higher with the tube in the socket, but check. So that DC voltage, we're now removing it from the tube and we're allowing the RF electron pixies to go into the tube and the tube can now amplify. If you don't have this voltage drop when you step on the pedal, that tube will not do anything. But that is how you probe for bias flop. You must have a positive 100 and plus 20 volts for cutoff to shut the amp off when you're not on the key. And then when you step on the pedal, you must have that on a switched circuit. Must have that on a switched circuit so it drops to three and a half, four volts. Five volts is even acceptable. But not much more than that. And this voltage drop is all determined by the diodes that are in the string. Now, if you go to the Harbach board, let's say you have the Harbach high voltage replacement board, you're gonna be closer to the five volt range, which is fine. You don't wanna go much past like five and a half volts, so the tube's gonna not react very well, which is kinda of cool. You could put a variable resistor in line with the center tap of the transformer, and you can actually dial the reactance of the tube up and down, but you get too far out of that and it starts screwing with the class operations of tubes, so don't do that. 
it's an old CB or trick, don't do it. But that's what we're looking for, is we're wanting to make sure that when we step on the foot pedal, the center tap of the transformer gets engaged up to the zener, the zener is going to drop to your three volts. If you see that three volts, it's not a bias issue, then now it becomes an input issue. Is the RF making it from the coax connector at the back, through the input circuit, and then to the tubes? That's how you check for your bias. Very simple. Okay, shut this down up here on the front. And I know for a fact that this amp is going to work now that we've fixed the high voltage, fixed the filtering bank, fixed this breaker, and fixed uh, the keying circuit. Got all the bugs worked out of it now. And if you like this video, this little short clip on how to fix your bias or any of the other videos I've done, make sure to hit subscribe. Give me a little thumbs up. It helps with the YouTube algorithm. And really, if there's anything I can do to help you, don't hesitate to come over and join us at Patreon.com. BBIAMS Patreon.com. Only costs a buck and just a little bit of help goes a long ways over here for me. And it allows me to be able to show that you're supporting us. Thanks, gentlemen. Got more to go. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Okay. We're going to do another quick little how-to video because i got to build these for this particular SB220 that's in here for repair. Um, real quick, we're going to go over how to make your own parasitics. I get this all the time. And there's no magical mysticism that goes along with this. Let me just put that out there on Front Street right now. This is very easy and anybody can do it. These are five watt carbon pack resistors. Okay? Carbon ceramic, carbon pack. They cannot be wire wound. They cannot. You can buy these directly from Chinesium Shmoo. Um, I come in a package that looks like this. And this is the Chinesium Shmoo part number. Please feel free to pause if you need to get that number. Also put it in the description in the doobly-doo down below. But that is the eBay part number. And you can also find them on Mauser with that same part number. Okay. What you need is a piece of 14 gauge wire. It's about six and a half to seven inches long. Doesn't need to, and we're talking real measurable inches, boys and girls, not man inches. See, this one here from zero to here is seven inches. Seven. And from zero to here is six. They both need to be roughly the same length, six to seven inches long. Okay. You're going to figure out where the middle of this wire is at. And they must, they must be relatively straight and smooth. No bends, no little doobly-doos. Um, you want to make this out of solid copper wire. If you want to, you can spend the money and you can get the silver plated or nickel plated, nickel plated wire if you want. But it's still got to be solid extrusion. Okay. You're going to need four 100 ohm resistors because we're shooting for 50 ohm. That's what we're shooting for. All right. You're going to figure out where the middle of the wire is. Let's go over here and get out our universal make you feel short tool. That's the middle. We're going to take anything round that is roughly three-fourths of an inch round. And that just magically happens to be the same size as a bird element. Anything three-fourths of an inch round, take the middle of it, put it on the three-fourths inch round thing, and bend it into a, a horseshoe. Hence the term horseshoe parasitic. Horseshoe. See that? Horseshoe. The idea is to make sure that this bend is nice and smooth and has no sharp edges. We're going to take our now 50 ohm 10 watt resistor and we're going to put it so that it is exactly one inch from the base of the hole or the base of the opening of the horseshoe. So our leads, bottom of the base, moving to be about an inch away and then we're going to solder the leads to our 12 volt wire. It's that simple. So, remember, resonant length inductance is a thing. So, we want to keep from the edge of this lead to the bottom of the hoop within about an inch. Let's go ahead and we'll glob some solder on this. Let it flow over. That simple. Flow, flow. Now, once... 
you guys in the YouTube land having to watch. Once you've got it tacked on, I like to take the wire and physically mechanically bend it over. Just like so. And then we'll cut it off flush. See that? I like to have a mechanical connection. Imagine that. Mechanical connection for us to solder to. So now, we'll solder this up. Right here, like so. Solder, solder, solder. Solder, solder, just like so. That looks good. Come back and touch up this one side. Need my needle nose. Mechanical connection is not necessary, but I found that a lot of guys can't really solder. So if I don't show them to do a mechanical connection, I'm going to get blown up tomorrow with a bunch of comments saying, I built it just like you showed me and it fell apart. You don't know what you're talking about. Okay, so we're going to even this out. Take our needle nose and right at our solder joint, we're going to just bend this over nice and smooth. So it's got a nice smooth edge to it, nice good radius. Remember what I just said, no hard radiuses, none whatsoever. That is your horseshoe parasitic suppressor. That is by far vastly superior to this old school system. So once again, we'll get out our man crying measuring tool, seven, seven, so we'll go three and a half our three-fourths inch round thing, whatever it is. We're going to bend it around in a hoopy. Okay. We're going to get out our tape measuring tool once again, and from the bottom of the horseshoe to the one-inch mark, we're going to put ourselves, our suppressor, into play. Grab our soldering iron. Let's talk about how to mount these up here real quick. You want to have a mechanical connection here at the top of the plate choke. So you can bring the wire through. There's two little eyelets on this thing. Bring the wire through and hook it over and mechanically connect it. It'll help support it. Believe it or not, these do vibrate a little bit from the fan moving behind it. And you want to provide this joint to be as strong as it possibly can. Um, You'll see that this one is mounted flat, horizontally, and this one's mounted vertically going down. We do that for a resonance thing. Um, we don't want these two horseshoes to be in the same plane orientation. You'll find that out if you do decide to, they'll just, no matter what you do, they'll smoke because they see each other. And you're gonna have a residency issue. So one goes down, other one goes flat. And same thing for the ones that you buy off the old internet there off of eBay. So just keep that in mind. Mechanical connection, through hole connection, and you're good to go. These resistors are worth their weight in gold, by the way. These old resistors. Because we are forced to use the newer style resistors that are made from different material from the 1950s, this material had a little bit of capacitance to it. If this resistor is not disintegrated or burned, you do not need to replace it. This actually works better than these resistors here with this material, with this resistor. I wish I could get these resistors in bulk that are still being manufactured, but it is not a thing. So unfortunately, this is what we're stuck dealing with. There's about eight, five to eight puff worth of capacitance inside that resistor just because of the material it's made of. These, on the other hand, don't have those characteristics. Hence the reason why you see a Meritron and some of the other tube builders um, here recently try to compensate for that by adding capacitors to the parasitic circuit. You personally, I don't want to have any extra capacitance up here if possible. So, on that note, that's how you build your own parasitic suppressors. Let's hook this box up and run it. Okay. So I've got you setting way back from the amplifier for a reason. Hopefully we'll keep the RF out of the microphone. 
Um, we're on the 1,000 watt slug over here. So, let me show you what we're going to put into this for drive. And this is set up more for 10 meters, by the way. Hello. I'm going to put about 110 watts in it. Hello. Off the scale. One, two, one, two. Hello. About 500 bird. Hello. One, two, one, two. Plate amp meter's working. Hello. Relative power's working. Hello. One, two. Grid meter's all working. So, with that being said, hello. 110 watts in. We'll go up to the 2x scale. Remember, you guys, right here, between the 40 and the 60 is 1,000. So 60 is 12. Next hash mark is 14, and 16 is the 80. That's 1,600 watts, by the way. Only putting 100 watts in it, so. Hello, one, two. Hello, one, two. I'm getting 1,500 watts out of it with 110, 115 going in. Now, that being said, the guy that gets this box, because he's gone and done the, the silly thing and got the RF tuner, this tune knob, it's really sensitive. Watch. Hello. I moved that two needles width and it fell out 300 watts. Hello. It's 1200 watts of power. Hello. 1600 watts of power. Watch. That's that's to me is crazy. We're talking about this much meter move, needle movement here. Watch. Hello. 1600 watts. Hello. 1200 watts. That's by moving that from about there to there. And this is really hard to find its resonant point. So, you're going to be somewhere in that area. I gotta re-index that knob to something useful. There we go. God, I'm so glad I don't have to tear this apart again. Okay. Hello. So right between the 10 and the 15, like more or less towards the 15. But watch this once again, very, very sensitive. Okay, if you get this on your end and you can't get it to dial up power, it's because you got these two knobs adjusted right. Hello. <coughs> That's pointed at the 15. Hello. That's pointed at the 10. Now, it has come to my attention that there are some people out there that don't understand why I put so much drive into one of these boxes when I'm testing it. As it was explained to me, that dude, I effing hate that dude. He overdrives every SB220 on his workbench. And my, my response to that is, but I have to. 
Well, it doesn't matter. That's just not the proper way to run them. And he's giving people the idea that they can do all that kind of power and blah, blah, blah. blah, 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 blah. Negative amateur operator. Huh. This guy obviously doesn't understand that it's my job to repair the box. It's not my job to run it like that. And when I come out and very clearly say, okay, I've got to test the amplifier to its max potential to prove to the customer that it is working at its full potential, it is right over the top of his head. So, needless to say, um, don't put more than 100 watts into your SP220. Um, otherwise, I'll be demonstrating to you the wrong set of skills. We're going to forget about me demonstrating how to repair your amplifier, how to build the parts to keep it running, or what you got to do to fix it. We're going to get hyper-focused on just the input power. He's got a point. No more than about 220 watts max, period, ever. More like 200 or 185 max. Peak power, by the way. Not bird. Not average. Peak. This beat up bag of bolts is fixed. It's fixed. So I'm going to let everything cool off. This is where I'm stopping for the night. I'll come out tomorrow morning and I'll put all this back together and put it back in his box. We're almost blood to zero here. It's coming to my attention that this light bulb here is out. Well, tomorrow when this thing's all bled off and all bled down and safe for me to stick my fleshy bits back inside of it, I'll change the light bulb out. And that'll be the tail end of the story tomorrow, and we'll catch up with you then. After a massive redesign on this box, um, I cut the 2x4s out of the top runners. I left the bottom ones in place, so... But then I took some of this hard pack foam and put it down underneath so it'll help cushion the bottom. I moved this runner forward, this stud runner forward. Sorry. Moved this stud runner. There was a like a two by six that was run across that thing. Um, moved it forward quite a bit. It's got two inches of the blue packing foam all the way around it. Two layers of it. It's just hard because I got a lot of time and energy into the rebuild of this thing. And the crates are hard to come by. I want, to make the, I want to make this crate work, so it's got to have padding on it all over it. So, yeah. are strong. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah. It's got padding all the way around it, that's all I can say. Padding in it, the box is bowed in the middle. <laughs> oh, if it wasn't fun, I wouldn't do it. Maybe it'll make it there. Maybe it won't. We don't know. Hopefully, it will. We've got a lot of work into this. No gap, no gap. A little bit of a gap. 
Let's see if we can cheat this a little bit. I need a pilot bit. Well, to the owner of this, this wood crate. That's it. I'm done with y'all. Y'all. Good luck. It's uh It's going out of here way better than what it came in. Hopefully it doesn't shake itself to death. There's a bag of uh screw hardware like the internal armor armor hardware, the internal plate. Um, your rectifying diodes are in here. I threw that soft key thing that you sent up here away. That thing is garbage. Fucking garbage. It doesn't deserve to be in anything. Threw it away. Um, here's what caused your trip to Idaho. Gentlemen, I'm going to go throw this in the back of the truck and get a shipping quote for it. And it's ready to leave here. I don't want it here. It needs to go home. I'm going to go get me some lunch. And when I come back, I think we're going to start today's game of what's in the box. Big shout out to XS. Big thanks to Siglin. You guys know how to get a hold of me if you need my help. Speaking of that, i got to go and spend the next couple hours on the phone. You guys have a good day. I appreciate you. I'll see you. Click, click.